The Fanboy, Episode 82. Hi everybody, Mario Francisco Robles, MFR here with you, and this is the 82nd edition of the Fanboy Podcast. How's everybody doing out there? It has been, it's been a while, hasn't it? I, I had to kind of take an unexpected, unintended uh, recess for the last three weeks. Right? There has not been a new episode since November the 30th, and I'm very sorry about that. This month has just gotten away from me. It's been bananas. And between some personal crises, stuff going on with the uh, concerns for health of my relatives, concerns of my own health. I had an injury last week. I took a fall and I was using crutches. It's, it, it's been a very interesting time to be yours truly these last few weeks. So I, I thank you for your patience. And because of your patience and because of how much I love you guys and how bad I feel that this is the only episode I will have delivered in all of December... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and announce that tonight, today, I should say, this episode will not be the final episode of 2018. That was my original plan. I was originally going to treat today like it was the season finale, similar to what I did last year, where I interviewed Mark Miller at around this time last year, and then I took a break until mid-January. Uh, that was the plan. But I've decided I'm going to do one more episode next Friday. And the reason being that we got, you know, I, I have to give Aquaman its due. I have to give it a proper spoiler post-mortem. And I feel like today's too soon. You know, today is when the movie has arrived. And a lot of you, you know, are going to see it today or tomorrow or yesterday. You know, so there were a lot of screenings on Thursday. Uh, and some of you have already seen it. But there's also a fair amount of you who may or may not have yet. And I tend to not touch spoilers on opening weekend. I touch that the following weekend. So for next week, I'm going to amass a nice little roundtable discussion, taking a whole nice spoilerific post-mortem look at James Wan's Aquaman. The episode will open with me discussing my personal in-depth opinions on things, and then we'll go ahead and bring on the roundtable and have a whole full-on discussion about Aquaman, about the DC brand as a whole. We're going to be able to look at this weekend's box office numbers, which is something we can't really do just yet. The early numbers are in, the projections are in. It's looking pretty solid, but I don't like to count my uh, chickens before they've hatched. So for, so for next week, it'll be all Aquaman. It'll be some spoilers. It'll be some, uh, maybe a little bit other stuff. I got some other uh, irons in the fire that I'm working on that hopefully I can reveal to you next week. And I will also have some special guests, not just Revenge of the Fans people, too. Uh, it might be another uh, crossover event. I've got some correspondents from other websites who I've invited and have said they want to come in and come on the show and discuss Aquaman with me. I'm not going to announce any specifics yet because schedules change, things happen. So I don't want to get you excited about anyone in particular just yet until I've recorded the conversation and it's in the can. Because up until then, things change. It happens all the time. But just know, I'm putting together a nice little, you know, elite team of people to discuss Aquaman with you next week for the final episode of 2018 and what will be the final episode of the Fanboy Podcast until January the 21st. Okay? But, um... Let's talk about today. Let's talk about December the 21st. Because, you know, to be perfectly honest, I was getting a little nervous this morning. I was getting a little nervous this morning because today is basically, you know, the deadline for something that I'd heard about. You know, I had had a, I had one of my sources reach out to me in late November, basically to inform me that right before the holiday break, before the year is over, DC was going to give us something nice, you know, give fans just something to kind of help, you know, put that loving feeling in their hearts for DC. Since, you know, right now, you know, the, the buzz is good. Aquaman's doing well. People are excited about the Titans finale. Things are going really nicely if you're a DC fan right now. And they kind of wanted to capitalize on that. And I came into today looking at my clock, looking at the calendar, and I'm like, I guess they scrapped that. Because today's pretty much the last day that they could give us any surprises because they're going on break after this. And lo and behold, before I could record, some cool things came to light. 
For one, they dropped an official uh, Doom Patrol teaser. They they dropped some official looks at all the main characters. We got our first real good look at Cyborg. And there's something else going on, too. They are on DC Daily, and this actually flew under my radar, because tr truth be told, I don't watch the show, which is kind of ironic, I guess, because I broke the story that the show would exist, but I, never, I don't actually watch the show. But uh, listener uh, Gabe Nakamura let me know via Twitter that back on episode 61, which must have taken place about two weeks ago now, they teased that today, December 21st, the day before the holiday break, they were going to unveil exclusively this Christmas gift that they have on their set. They have this mannequin with wrapping around it and a big bow, and they say it's some costume that's never been shown to the public before, and they're not allowed to open it until today on December 21st. So something tells me that that is what my source was intimating. That, you know, that today was going to be the day that we got our Doom Patrol stuff, that they revealed a new costume we've never seen before. So, you know, it's kind of nice on, on the way out of this year to basically have something like that confirmed. And it's not even like a scoop, you know. Truth be told, I don't really benefit from this. I didn't write a story about it. This news wasn't broken through me. I'm not getting any clicks because of it. Uh, it was literally just something cool that I heard that I passed on to you, and I'm glad it came true. Because A, it feels nice to you know not have just gotten your hopes up for nothing. Uh, some of you got a little overhyped. That's on you, okay? I never said it was going to be big or small. I told you, I don't really know exactly what it is. I just know it's coming right before they leave for the break, okay? But, um, yeah, but anyway, so it feels nice to have gotten, you know, your, your, your emotion up and then be able to deliver something before the holiday break. And it's also nice to know that I can continue to trust this source who seems to know about stuff that's coming down the pike. And for whatever reason, they like giving me a heads up. So, you know, uh, I, I really appreciate that. And if you're watching or listening, thanks for uh, continuing to keep me in the loop on stuff that I'm, that's probably way above my pay grade. <laughs> um, but uh, speaking of things that are above my pay grade, I put up a report earlier today over on revengeofthefans.com about some stuff I'm hearing about Batman. And before I go into it any further, I would like to just sort of disclaim and sort of apologize for the fact that I can't go any further than this. I had to be extremely, extremely careful how I worded things. I even, you know, I, I allowed my source to read the column and then read a second draft of it to make sure that they were protected enough because there was some, there was some paranoia around this stuff coming out. So, you know, I know that this is going to be uh, annoyingly vague but just know I, I really have no choice. If I want to continue to get information from this person, and I do, uh, I have to abide by, you know, the, their rules. And they want me to keep things very much on the surface. I can't go any further than this, okay? But basically what I wrote about today on the site and that I'd like to touch on with you today is this idea that Matt Reeves seems to be taking Batman in a new direction. Now, we know that he's been wanting to, you know... Like, he's been working on something special, and we know that there's all this mystery around it. He's had the job for almost two years, and we've heard very little actual specifics about it. It seems like the whole thing is shrouded in mystery, and that, you know, he's looking to do some cool, never-before-seen things with the characters, and so on and so forth. But I can now tell you, based on what I've been told, and based on what little I can share with you, that he really does seem to be trying to sort of change the Batman paradigm a little bit. Because something I wrote about in the article is that if you think about it, traditionally speaking, Batman has been treated as an action hero, as an action figure. All his movies have had a lot of big action centerpieces, you know, Batmobile chases, cars going off of roofs, big crazy fight sequences, you know, just they've always at their core been action movies, you know, and yes, the Nolan movies dug a little deeper, they were almost like, like Dark Knight in particular was almost like a mafia movie, you know, and they've kind of dabbled in other genres, but from what I hear about what Reeves is working on here, some of what's been said about his first draft of the script, which by the way, I'm sorry if I'm a little stuffy, I'm, uh, I've got a cold, so it is what it is, this is as good as I sound today, so I'm trying to uh, be tolerable for you, but I digress. Uh, what I've heard about the first draft of the script is that it's one of these things where it's 
it, it very much falls in line with with uh, early rumors we heard that he was looking at films like Seven and Zodiac and The Game. Ba- basically, in other words, David Fincher's uh, old ideas. Uh, you know, David Fincher's older movies. And what's interesting about that is, you know, some of you were very upset that he seemingly tossed Ben Affleck's script in the trash. Um, you know, the same script that Jay Oliva had said was like the best Batman script he'd ever read. The same script that, you know, Chris Terrio did a polish of after Ben Affleck and Jeff Johns worked on it together. Well, it looks like he kept something of it. You know what I mean? I, I'm not, I don't know if it's literally he kept something of it. But to me, it's too much of a coincidence that we had heard that Affleck was looking at David Fincher also when he was writing. And people were comparing some of his early bullet points tonally and everything what he wanted to do with his Batman versus Deathstroke movie was to make, like, he was modeling it after the game, the David Fincher film starring uh, Michael Douglas. So it's interesting to me that this David Fincher seed has carried over even into the new script. So I don't know if Reeves, you know, just liked the idea of approaching this in a way similar to how David Fincher would, or if he really liked the what, you know, the elements that Ben Affleck borrowed from the game for this and he wanted to carry it over. But there's this interesting through line about the Fincher films and the next Batman film, which which to me, by the way, is extra sweet because long before there were ever rumors about the game or Seven or any of this stuff, before anyone knew what Affleck was drawing inspiration from, before anyone knew what Matt Reeves was drawing inspiration from, I wrote a column once at Latino Review uh, or LRM Online where I said, like, my dream pick, my top pick to direct a Batman movie is David Fincher. And that was my like pie in the sky dream choice. And so for me, it like it tickles me to hear that there's definitely going to be some Fincher-esque uh, inspiration on this. And it also looks like it's going to be the first film that really kind of moves away from being an action movie and being more of a noir-driven detective tale, the kind that Reeves has already alluded to. And as it turns out, it wasn't lip service. Remember, sometimes that stuff can be lip service. Remember, we heard for a while that this new Hellboy movie was going to be darker and scarier and more mature than what we've seen before. And you guys saw the trailer earlier this week. And if you haven't, I suggest that you do. That does not look scarier or darker or more mature. If anything, it almost seems like an extension of the Guillermo del Toro movies, which is fine. I enjoyed the, the, the first two. But it was, it was jokey. It had, you know, it had Billy Idol money, money in the, uh, in the in the trailer. It's a lot more lighthearted. It, you know, to me, the trailer reminded me much more of like Suicide Squad in terms of tone than anything that was like darker and scarier and more, you know, gruesome and mature. So, you know, sometimes these things can be lip service. You know, the fact that Reeves said that he was trying to tell a noir-driven direct, uh, detective tale didn't necessarily mean he was going to follow through on that. He might have just been, you know, dabbling with that idea. But from what I hear, he's not just dabbling. The first draft of the script is definitely heavy on the detective elements. It's definitely heavy on him you know, being the world's greatest detective. And not necessarily there being a ton of spectacle or big crazy action set pieces. Like the core of the story really is Batman on the hunt trying to figure something out, trying to solve a crime and get down to the bottom of something. And I don't know about you, but to me, that's exciting. To me, it's showing Batman in a new light. You know, I've said many times that I would love it if they start establishing him more as like the genius of the DCU, the the Sherlock Holmes of the Justice League. Really, you know, let's dive into that genius level intellect that he has, his intuition, his thoughts, the way he looks at a crime differently than your average crime fighter, the way he's able to analyze data and evidence and follow leads and all that sort of stuff. Like, it sounds like we're really getting that kind of a movie. And, you know, it also kind of explains to me, at least, why he's taking his time, because this is going to be a departure from what we've seen. You know, it's going to be a very stark departure from the Batman we saw in Justice League, and even the Batman and BVS, you know, BVS was still kind of at its at its heart was an action movie. You know, it finished with three, you know, superheroes fighting a giant alien. You know, you had car chases and gunfights and the warehouse brawl. You know, it was a, that was an action movie. 
And this is really going to be much more of a hard-boiled detective tale. And, it, you know, that, that kind of explains why Reeves is kind of trying to create some space between what he's working on and what's come before and why we're unlikely to get this film prior to 2021 because we really kind of you know they really want to like close off that chapter let people kind of forget about 2017 batman and be ready for what 2021 batman is going to be which is a whole other kind of thing so to me that's exciting uh like i said over on the twitter earlier this week you know I've always been kind of on the fence about Matt Reeves. Not because I'm not a fan of his work. I have been a fan of his work. I think he I think he does, you know, some really good stuff. But I, you know, I, I was always a little bit confused by the love fest where people were doing backflips about a Matt Reeves Batman movie right from the start as if he was the second coming of whatever, you know. I, I never really got that. For me, it was like, okay, we have a very, very talented and capable director. Let's see what he can do. But for me, my... my my appetite for a for a Matt Reeves Batman movie was not really any higher than just anyone else's Batman movie. His name attached to it didn't do a hell of a lot for me. But hearing this, hearing now that the first draft has come in and the second draft is going to be turned in pretty soon, and the fact that it seems to be more more of a you know hard boiled detective tale, that to me gets me excited. Like now you've got my attention, Mr. Reeves. Now I really want to see what you're working on over there. So that's exciting. That's exciting. Um, earlier this week, I also got to talk a little bit about Superman, which I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, I kind of like Superman. Um, so I wrote a report just kind of like, you know, there was nothing earth shattering in there, but it was more so a reminder because a lot of sites similar to mine, you know, a lot, a lot of people who work on the same sort of level that I do have kind of in my eyes made the mistake of speaking of certain topics as if they're just completely officially done you know like when it comes to superman in particular they say that cavill's out we'll never see him again and so on and so forth but to me i think it's important that we remember that warner brothers has not officially said anything and in general you know, it's been a lot of reading of the tea leaves. There's been a lot of unconfirmed sources, a lot of people saying these things. But, you know, remember, I thought Affleck was out 100%. And then what did I hear two months ago? And I'm not the only person who heard it. And there really seems to be some traction to the story, which, you know, two months ago, I heard that Affleck and some, you know, some faction within the studio had approached Matt Reeves about maybe getting him involved in this Batman movie. And that tells me it's like, Oh, so nothing's ever really set in stone until they say it. That's probably logical, right? But I wrote a Superman story just to kind of remind people of what the facts are, what the reading of the tea leaves seems to be, and the fact that internally, as per a source of mine, there's been no official mandate or anything set that says that Cavill is out. And it's one of those things where I just, you know, I want you guys as Superman fans... So just, you know, let's see what happens. I know some of you are happy to hear him move on. Hi, Mauricio. I know some of you want to put as much distance between the current DCU and the former DCEU as possible. But, you know, it's important just to note that things are not official yet. While it's still unlikely, I would say, stranger things have happened. So all I know is that as of like two weeks ago, he's still being spoken of internally at Warner Brothers as not officially out of the picture. So that tells me that there's wiggle room. Had they made a final, this is over decision, you know, we would know that by now. And it seems to me like if, if Aquaman does amazing business and Walter Hamada sees that these characters that were introduced under Snyder are still viable and all they really need is a fresh coat of paint, then maybe they will be inspired to make a Superman movie. You know, you never know. So I'm hopeful that, you know, so may, maybe something will change in the next few months. Maybe I'm just being naive. Maybe I'm just being overly optimistic and cheerful. Who knows? Remember, more so than anything, more so than Cavill returning, more so than Snyder's continuity staying in place, more so than any of that, I just want a Superman movie. You know, I, 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 want, I want there to be something. So I'm just being optimistic and hopeful and if that gets on your nerves or if you're upset that I'm still holding out hope 
and, and, and clinging to certain little things. I'm sorry. I'm just a fan. And what kind of a Superman fan would I be if I gave up all hope, you know? Um, but uh, all right. So, you know, this episode is going to primarily be comprised of a nearly hour and a half long conversation I had with some really, really awesome people about the Arrowverse crossover Elseworlds. You know, some of you have been asking me for a while to check out the Arrowverse. And uh, how you doing, Brent? I finally checked out Crisis on Earth X. I finally watched Elseworlds. And, um, you know, I got to tell you, I, I, I was pretty impressed. You know, it, it's it, it's... It's always it always comes down to your perspective, right? It always comes down to the filter with which you look at things. And I can't rate an Arrowverse series on the same level that I would rate a Hollywood movie. You know, it's just it's it, it's it's apples and oranges. It's very different. So what I go into when I put on Arrowverse is very different than what I go into when I sit down and like go see Aquaman, which I'm going to do for a second time tonight for the Revenger watch party here in Queens. I get to see Aquaman with some really cool people tonight. I'm super excited about that. But um, you know, so the expectations are very different. And I found myself very pleasantly surprised by what I saw going on in the Arrowverse. Like, now I get it. And something that I'm just going to briefly touch on here, because I, I don't really get to say it much in the conversation that's about to, you know, happen with, with my roundtable, is the ambition of it. I find really impressive. You know, in the beginning of Crisis on Earth X, seeing all the characters come together, having them introduce the whole Nazi angle, them having that confrontation by the construction building with all the red, you know, um, you know, whatever you call it, construction pipes or foundation, whatever. I remember just feeling like, wow, this is really cool. This is really happening. You know, if I'm a DC fan and I've been looking forward to some sort of really cohesive, creative, well thought out DC universe, I got to pitch myself looking at this stuff. Here's Superman and Arrow, I mean, Supergirl and Arrow and Flash taking, you know, taking on these evil versions of themselves. And I don't know, I just, I, I found myself very impressed by the scope and the scale of the type of stories that they're trying to tell. And the fact that they're not scared of anything. You know, they announced uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths. Like, they're going after some huge stories here. They don't care that they're on the CW. They don't care that their budgets are like, you know, a quarter of what a movie would get. They're going for it. They know that the fans want it. They know that right now, for better or worse, the best and most accessible way to get to some cohesive shared DC universe is to flip on the CW every week. They know this and they're going for it. You know, in the past, you've kind of felt like with Smallville or other ones where like they were trying very carefully not to tread on anyone else's territory. They've been trying to like, all right, you know, we're going to do this quiet little offshoot. Even Krypton, in a way, to me, felt like that because it has to do with characters that are totally on the peripheral. You know, Kal-El's grandfather, that's not a thing. You know what I mean? And from what I've heard, from what I've heard they've made that interesting. But the point is, you know, we've had a lot of series that seem scared to really go for something huge because they know that they're trespassing on sort of holy territory. But when it comes to the Arrowverse... They don't seem to have any of that shame. They're like, all right, well, we're going to go after all the big stories that we see fit. And we're going to bring in all these characters. We're going to get weird. We're going to bring in the monitor. We're going to bring in, you know, they're not scared to really go for it. And for me, that was the big positive takeaway I got from basically binging Crisis on Earth X and Elseworlds back to back over the course of the last, you know, eight or so days. Um... And yeah, I, I think that's kind of all I want to say for now because, you know, the, the conversation I have with my roundtable went much longer than anticipated. So at some point, I may just give a more direct, like, specific review of uh, Crisis on Earth X. Maybe I'll just release that as a separate video or something. But for now, it is time to get into my Revenger roundtable discussion on the Arrowverse crossover, Elseworlds. 
It is now time at last to unveil, unleash, and introduce the Revenger Roundtable that I put together to discuss the Elseworlds crossover from the Arrowverse DC TV universe. So right now we're going to start things off with some introductions for you. Here he is. He's the co-host of the Weekly Geek Podcast known as the Fanboy Garage, which is part of the Revenge of the Fans Podcast Network, Mr. Aaron Verola. You have failed this city. What's up, fellas and <laughs> girls and gals and everybody? I'm excited to be here. What's Always going to be a good time. He's the host of Multiverse Musings, a DC Comics podcast, and our lead critic over at Revenge of the Fans, Mr. Adam Basciano. Hey, guys. This is fun. I'm used to listening to all you guys on your various shows, so this is... Yeah, this is, uh, th- I mean, we're doing our own crossover event, if you think about it, how fitting, yeah. you know? Yeah, and for once, I, for once, I don't have to play the host. So there cool. you go, there you yeah. go, you get to sit back and be pretty and give us those beautiful opinions of yours. Well, everything but the pretty part, yeah. <laughs> He's Revenge of the Fans lead reporter and associate editor, Mr. Matt Vernier. Hey, now, thanks for having me on for the first and probably last time. Oh, no, no, no. Oh. I have a feeling I'm going to be roping you in to do more of these. Cause <laughs> did he throw out a hey now? Hey now. Yes. Yes, he did. Of course I did. <laughs> He's I a know, Rick Shue. He's a passionate columnist and part-time conspiracy theorist. He's the Scarlet fan himself, Mr. Brandon Alvarado. Honored to be here, fellas and lady. And now, you may have noticed I mentioned this being a crossover, and yet that makes no sense because everyone I've described is part of the Revenge of the Fans family. Well, here's the crossover part. Because she is a columnist and co-host of the Wobam Entertainment Podcast, Miss Katie Gilstrap. Hi, everyone. And you forgot website manager, by the way. Oh, oh, website manager. Oh, pardonnez-moi, <laughs> pardonnez-moi. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love, but by the way, can I just say, first of all, just to kind of get it off the table, I want to thank all you guys for everything that you do. You know, Katie, since I introduced, introduced you last, I'm going to thank you first. I've really enjoyed the way Wabam Entertainment and Revenge of the Fans are kind of creating this like synergy together. Online, we've become kind of like this big RTF, Wabam, mashed up, beautiful, mixed family. And uh, I'm looking forward to a lot more of that in 2019. So so thank you for yeah. it's a Wabam for embracing RTF and its first year of its existence. Yes, they, we, we really do appreciate y'all, and we're really grateful for everything that we've been able to pull from y'all. I know we've had several <laughs> podcast crossovers before. Yeah, yeah. So, well, that's why I'm glad to excited. finally have you on one of ours. And I just, you know, like I said, I have a feeling we're, we're going to be getting a lot more of these done in 2019 because you guys are all so much fun. No, nothing makes me more happy than when I jump on Twitter and I see that you guys have like a 45 message thread on something. <laughs> I'm like, I don't even know where to begin. I'm just going to sit back and watch. And oh, there's Matt V with a play on words. And, you know, it's, there's Isaac being mildly inappropriate. And, uh,. <laughs> I just, I have a lot of fun with you guys, so thank you. And for the rest of you guys, you know, we're coming up on almost a year. On January 15th, it'll mark one year of Revenge of the Fans. And Aaron, Matt, Adam, Brandon, you guys have thrown so much energy and so much of your love and your passion into making this first year so special and getting this site off the ground and getting the podcast network off the ground. So I just kind of want to, like, express my gratitude for all that you do, all that you've done, and uh, here's to conquering some more new territory in 2019. What do you say? Cheers. Oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, Matt, especially, dude. You're like my. You're like my. You're my. You're my soldier. You've. Been, I mean, well, how many articles would you say you've written <laughs> this year? Hundreds. Um, yeah, probably over, over 400. But. But who's um, counting? <laughs> but I. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm not. Even though you you deleted my best headline ever today. <laughs> oh, <laughs> can, can we just announce what? Go ahead, say what it was. Well, I was assigned to write a story about um, how the genie was going to be blue in Aladdin, and I said that you shouldn't worry because Will Smith will blue himself in Aladdin. <laughs> There you go. He promises to blue himself in Aladdin or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then you wonder why I had to censor that. It was a total Arrested Development joke <laughs> and nothing more. Listen, 
So let, let let's get down into the meat and potatoes. Let's talk some Else Worlds. Let's talk some Arrowverse. I think this should be an interesting conversation because we all kind of have different levels of fandom with this, you know, with this franchise, and kind of we're, we're gonna get lots of different perspectives here because, like, you know, I'm someone who doesn't watch any Arrowverse, and yet in the last week and a half, based on everyone's recommendations, I went and I basically binged the last year's crossover, the uh, Crisis on Earth X, and mm -hmm. then that led for me directly into elseworld so all i've really ever seen are these most you know these two most recent crossovers so i kind of approach this as like an outsider looking in and i'm sure you know you guys especially a couple of you watch this stuff every single week and you hang you know the ins and outs of this whole universe so you obviously you experience it very differently than i do so i'm kind of looking forward to kind of getting everyone's feedback and seeing where we all fall on this sucker um so right now, I kind of want to just first things first, kind of go around each of you and kind of give me your general thoughts on it. And then I'll kind of wrap up with, with, with what my big takeaway was. So, Aaron, why don't you start us off? Aaron, what, yeah. uh, what did you think of Elseworlds? I, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I would say that if I were, it was like two-thirds great and one-third good. Um, Which two-thirds were great? The first uh, two episodes. So I think okay. it's uh, it was the... The Flash episode and then the Arrow episode, yeah, um, were the best in my opinion. And then it kind of it, it kind of petered out uh, in the third, but uh, but overall, I thought it was great. Um, I I love the chemistry between you know Team Arrow and Team Flash, and you know a little mix of Kara and and Clark in there. So um, no, I thought I thought they did a very very great job at sort of stitching everything together and and making everything kind of feel cohesive because. Um, Specifically with the Supergirl stuff, because she's she's like hardly ever involved in anything that happens there. So yeah, no, I, I mean I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot. Good. And, and uh, how about you there, Adam? I know you watch a lot of these and you review yeah. them like every week, and you have your weekly column, the Tales of the of the DC Multiverse. Yes. So um, what did you think? No, I really I really enjoyed it for the most part. I think I was gonna let to be honest. No matter what they did, I was gonna watch it. But when they decided to uh, bring back Superman and introduce Lois Lane and then throw in Batwoman, and I was like, even though it's TV, take my money. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, it, it felt like watching a Justice League animated series episode, kind of. Yeah. Um, and it sort of, not to hammer home a point or, or beat a dead horse or whatever the saying is, it, it, it satisfied whatever the movie team up left lacking for me oh mm -hmm. i got you so in certain ways this made up for the fact that justice league was uh, <laughs> a steaming pile of mierda last year well, yeah. well I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far but yeah i, I, I got you isn't it sad by the way that we have to get our dc crossover thrills on tv and on because in the movies things got so uh out of hand isn't that just a little I, I, depressing i love it if i love it if both were working 100 percent. yeah you know, that's my my, my preferred choice but i'll, I'll take uh, i'll take quality wherever i can get it big or small screen so i got you now how about you matt what did you think i know you watch these with you know fairly with a fairly close eye yeah no i i loved it and i didn't n know how they could beat last year because after crisis on earth x happened i was like this is i don't know how you could go anywhere but down from here and then like the news came out that oh the legends aren't in this and i was like okay so they're doing but you know, I think the story would have suffered with them in there, and it, and I, yeah. and that's not coming from a hater. Like I like the legends a lot, but I don't think there was there was time for them. Like they, um, there's they always was, time for the legends. Well, you know, <laughs> they the uh, I think the the three leads together. It's the first time we saw all three leads like really be together the whole yeah. time, and that was and that was the fun of it. And you know, the focus was Barry and and Ollie um, switching. Um, bodies and stuff or whatever you want to call it. But, yeah. And, and uh, that, you know, that was fun to watch them play that. And I think if it got too muddled, I, so I think they kind of just, um, they streamlined it and um, you know, we didn't get enough Batwoman, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed the entire thing. Um, I love that, you know, everything, I think it was just a love letter to fans. Like they, these things are not easy to make. And I think they, everything they did was, was, um, for you know dc fans to sort of say thank you for um mm -hmm. sticking with them because you know they over started with just a shirtless Stephen amell doing the salmon letter like that's how this like 
universe started and it's sort of hard to believe and and so <laughs> you know and it's and it's turned into this and yeah and so uh you know the crossovers are um sort of a thank you from them to us and uh so i appreciate even even if it's not perfect i appreciate everything that it is and so i'm willing to overlook some you know mistakes or whatever but yeah and for you was it like a step up or a step down from crisis on earth x it sounds like you liked it better uh i yeah i mean it was more it was more streamlined it gave it gave moments and you know anytime you add you know any buddy from the bat family and then lois lane and superman uh you're gonna win points yeah Mm -hmm. yeah no i can't argue with that uh Mm -hmm. how about you mr scarlet fan what did you think brandon I thoroughly enjoyed it. I really loved um, everything I saw there. And as a fan that's watched all these shows from day one, um, I I feel I have a combination of what Aaron was saying about the show. That it was two two the first two episodes were excellent. The third one wasn't that great, but overall it was it was amazing. And I agree with Matt. This was a love letter for the fans. One of the things that I mostly enjoyed was is that even though they had Easter eggs Easter eggs at nauseum none of them felt out of place. They all felt like they were well written into the story as of uh, like letting them, letting us know as fans that, hey, we're going to put this little piece here for you, but we're not going to forget why you're here. You're here to see the story, to yeah. see these characters, how they interact, how they develop with each other, how they interact. Um, I personally truly enjoy how they have formed the CW Trinity, between yeah. Kara, Flash, and Arrow. And I think their chemistry and how they're prioritizing is, I think it's it's excellent. I, I like I like their banter and everything like that. And especially how a how Oliver and, and Oliver and Barry's characters, where they swap, how they start um, seeing into that introspective of their own shows or their own worlds. Um, as their worlds turn inside out, that exploration, I found it very interesting. Um, I loved Tyler Hecklin as Superman. I really enjoyed, um, I forgot her, um, Elsie Tullock, is that the name? Elizabeth Tullock, yeah. yeah. Elizabeth Tullock, yeah. I loved her as Lois Lane. Um, I, I, I really enjoyed it. And I thought that everything was just what it needed to be. Um, I couldn't ask for anything else. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, how about you, Katie? Well, these shows have always hold, held a special place in my heart. Like, Brandon, I got involved with these from day one, and that's how I got involved with Bo Bam. And so this crossover, it was really it was really a great emotional love letter to the fans, like everyone else has said. Um, I, enjoy, I think I enjoyed Crisis a little bit more. Um, dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Okay, I was so confused. Um... I think I enjoyed Crisis a lot more, but at the same time, this crossover was so perfect, and it was really, it was all a bundle of emotions that really brought the characters forward. So it lived up for you? It did. Yeah, because yeah, there, there was a lot of buzz, right? There was a lot of, like, hype leading up to it, all these different crazy, you know, pictures from the set, and all this, oh, they're going to have old school yeah. Flash, and they're going to have this, they're going to have that. You know, expectations were kind of sky high. And it sounds like for all you guys, it lived up, huh? Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah, yeah totally. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, for me, my main takeaway, uh, having w- binge-watched both uh, crossovers, is that, you know, it, it's one of these things where, you know, I'm almost glad that they have a fairly tight, limited budget because it forces them to focus on the character work. It, fo- it forces them to focus on the character development and, all- and having those beats in between all the spectacle that gets you to invest in these characters. I've, like, I've always said, like, sometimes mm-hmm. the best gift you can give a filmmaker is a low budget because it forces them to make sure the dialogue is as good as it can be. It forces them to focus on the elements, like, you know, the, the actual character development and the storyline rather than trying to wow us with a bunch of eye candy. You know, so I found mm-hmm. myself enjoying these two crossovers in a way that like I, I actually like I, I compare it to watching it's going to be weird, but like Avengers Age of Ultron, 
where my favorite parts of Age of Ultron were the party at Stark Tower, you know, at mm-hmm. Avengers Tower, and then the scene at Hawkeye's farm. Like, I love those things yeah. in between all of the hubbub where we get to see these characters shine, see their interplay, mm-hmm. have that banter, that chemistry, and really kind of put them, you know, the characters at the forefront, trying to spotlight on them rather than spectacle, you know? So I really appreciate that about the Arrowverse as a whole and then i was just surprised i have to ask you guys this as people who watch this all the time like does it always look this good because i i yes. have this like yes. really For the that's, most part, that's so surprising yeah, th- to me yeah i think from season two of the flash onward it it it, it started really good season one of the flash Great effects. That's one of the best. That pilot is one of the best pilots ever made. Because like that, that blows that me away. Because I, I feel yeah. like I feel like they get a bad rap because oh, it's a CW show. So mm-hmm. I, I've always heard like oh, it looks super cheesy. It looks super cheap. So I, I was going into this expecting like oh, this is going to look like a Mighty Morphin no. Power Rangers episode. Like this is going to be booty. Careful. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? <bothered> you? <laughs> now and the then, production value, value is definitely there. So I mean, oh yeah. And yeah. I have to say, they they definitely threw a lot more money at uh, Batwoman's suit because by far oh, she had yeah. the best costume I've ever like. It, honestly, yeah. probably the best rendition of a comic book hero's costume for TV. Period. One hundred percent agreed. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I just, I, you know, I I was just I was very much blown away by that. That the fact that it looked way better than I thought. And in general, the, the, the general ambition of the big action sequences blew me away, too. There was a lot of stuff, especially in Crisis on Earth X, where, like, there's a million things happening on the screen at once. Where there's, yeah. like, yeah, you know, the, these two are brawling towards the camera. And in the background, you got Supergirl blasting things with her eyes. And over here, you got Flash running around dealing with reverse Flash. And, like, they have all these different... They're spinning all these plates at once with, like, these unbroken cuts of this meticulously choreographed, well-staged action spectacle. And I'm mm. like, I'm watching a CW show? Like, wow. Like, listen, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not going to confuse it for, like, Holly, you know, like Hollywood quality. It's not... Or even, like, Game of Thrones, like, HBO level type TV effects. But for what it is, I think it looks... It's very convincing, and it works. If you're doing a comic book story, like, yeah, it looks a little bit, you know, a little cartoonish at times, but we're dealing with comic books come to life. Like, it's, I'm willing to kind of, you know, give them that, you know, yeah. despite this. So I have a question that's a little off topic, but Go for Mario, it. did you notice in Crisis on Earth X when Supergirl's being held captive and she said, my cousin will save me, the person who actually saves her is... The Adams, like, because he's holding the scalpel, and that was Brandon Rouse. So technically, oh, it was him. Love that. that. Yeah, oh, so good. That. <laughs> um, that's awesome. Well, was that the was... one? Was that the one at the end where she said, "You kind of look like my cousin"? Well, yeah, yeah. That, well, that was in that was in the one before. That was in oh, the okay, invasion yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then in in Earth X, she's like, "My cousin will save me." While she's on the table. Ended up being the legends saving her. But oh, that's amazing! But it was yeah. Brandon Routh doing it, so it was technically, you know, her. Yeah, because he's the one who got all miniature and landed on her chest but, and stopped the scalpel. Yeah. So that's amazing. So Superman did, yeah. So they <laughs> See, have little things like that in there too. That's just like it's it's, you know, they're just put, they just put it in there for There's, people like. I mean, us. listen, Not, yeah. nice little winks. I like. I got yeah. chills when when uh, in you know, I, you know. I know we got to focus on Elseworlds, but a Crisis on Earth X to me, by the way, I think I liked it a little better. To me, it had a little more kinetic energy. It had me a little more engaged in Elseworlds, but mm. that's neither here nor there at the moment. Um, but while wa- while watching that one, when she goes to confront the evil Supergirl, the, the you know General Kara, and she goes, "General, care to step outside or whatever?" Yeah. We're totally yeah. going to Superman too. I uh-huh. flipped out. She was even out there with the with the arms crossed and everything. I'm like, "You're through amazing. the window, yeah." It yeah. was. Mm-hmm. It yeah, could yeah. not have been played better. Now that's not to say though, you know, there are occasionally times where it's a little self indulgent. Some of the like, I, there were a couple of like cringy references that to me, I'm like, wow, okay, this, this like you pulled me out of it, and mm. I, I don't want to like poo poo anything because you know, we're so far we've been very positive, but there are occasional moments there where I'm like, okay, that was just like that fell totally flat. Like there's this moment in uh, in 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 Crisis again, in Crisis on Earth X. Where like Iris comes and she's there to like help uh, you know Kara off the table, like rescue her from the surgery or whatever, and she says something. She says, "Come with me if you want to live." 
<laughs> and she's obviously referencing Terminator, and and they, and they got Metallo walking around looking like a big green, you know, T eight hundred. But like that line, like to me, it, it falls flat because it's robbed of its context. The whole so, reason you say that, hang on, let me just get this out. Because <laughs> the whole reason that that line matters is because it's a stranger saying it. You know, like you, you have to take this leap of faith. Come with me if you want to live. In both Terminator movies, when when they when that is said, it's basically this innocent person <laughs> seeing this person from the future do something crazy, and then turn to them and say, "Come with me if you want to live." So it, the line has significance for to have. Iris say that to Kara. I mean, while they have an existing relationship, it was just like, oh, you're trying too hard. You know what I mean? It yeah. didn't work. The uh, the Flash does things like let like the the episode before Elseworlds. Um, they they went. It was their hundredth episode, and so there was some time travel involved. And they actually played like um, the oh, yeah. song from Back to the Future, yeah, like yeah. as they were going. <laughs> did they really? Going they totally. Yeah. They totally did. <laughs> yeah. And, like, and and that's. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Matt. No, yeah. They, so they, so the Flash does more on the nose stuff like that than, um, like they're they're known to do that in their own episodes. Yeah. Uh, but not just but in episodes. but in fairness to uh, to the Flash, I mean it's it's Ralph Didney doing it, so it's kind of like. <laughs> You know what I mean? That like you're like ah, oh, you know, if there's any other character that was going to do something like that, it's got to be this guy. <laughs> yeah. Now, now the interesting thing about that though is um, exactly what you were saying. That is that, and I think you see it more in Elseworlds more than Crisis. But to those that like us that watch the show constantly, if you look at the Flash episode, it feels like a Flash episode. If you mm-hmm. look at the Arrow episode. It feels like an hour episode. If you look at Supergirl, it feels like Supergirl. So me listening to Iris say that, making that conjunction, I know that The Flash is constantly doing self-conscious pop culture references <laughs> yeah. by different characters. So it, it does feel within. In your case, Mario, since you're an outsider looking in, yeah. I can understand how it would throw you off. Yeah, for but me, it was actually, cringy. <laughs> but it was actually right in line with the show. Okay. That's that that's well, an well, interesting that's an interesting point that you bring up though because that's exactly why I think the last episode in my in my opinion was the weakest uh because it it felt like Supergirl and that's like one of the ones I I'm like the least fan of. Oh, interesting. Um you know what I mean? So there were you know the way it was written some of the some of the action sequences felt very Supergirl-ish to me so I was like mm, yeah, it's all right. I prefer the other ones better, but I don't know if you guys picked up on that either. I don't know if that's now. Even... Now that super that Superman against vegan Superman fight was pretty epic. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> again, for for CW dollars, that was about as good as it gets. You know what I mean? That 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 was not bad at all. Um, now, obviously, one of the big things to come out of this was the introduction of Batwoman. So we got we got to touch on Batwoman a little bit. So, Katie, why don't you start us off? What were your thoughts on Ruby Rose as Batwoman? Well, first of all, can I say, like, I really want to know where she got her lipstick? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me uh, too. That is a valid point. Sephora? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, wait, wait. I'm going to tweet her right now. Oh, there. there you go. She's not, she's, not, she's not on Twitter. Crazy fanboys drove her away. That's true. Oh, that's yeah. oh damn it. That was, Sad. that was a really bad part and then something that really made me mad. But when she got cast originally, I was very excited for her because I've enjoyed a lot of what she's been in. And she really came through in this, um, in the crossover. She portrayed a great Batwoman. And People made fun of me, but the part where she goes and stares at her suit, I don't know about y'all, but I got a full, like, Christian Bale, like, <laughs> feeling from that oh, right there. That's cool. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this looks so cool. Like, I love this. But then people made fun of me for it, so I don't know. <laughs> okay. <Be> wrong. <laughs> I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. How about you there, Brando? Well, I, I, I truly enjoyed it. I think, I, think, um, I think I'm ready to see a pilot. I'm ready to see a pilot and see – I think there's a lot of potential with her. But the she question is, is, do you want to be a pilot? Uh, no. Oh, oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm, I'm, can, we, can we pause this? I'm going to get some alcohol right now. We're going to go down the road. No, no, no. We're, we're not going to take a Star Wars detour. I promise. <laughs> so, Brandon, continue. You, Star like, Wars all night. you enjoyed it, Brandon? No. You're good? You like that uh, one? No. I truly uh, I haven't seen Solo, so that's a different conversation. There you go. Um, but Ruby Rose. Ruby Rose. Ruby Rose is excellent as Batwoman. 
Um, did you guys think, uh, in my case, when I saw, when she's on the elevator, I think that scene was just epic. So I agree with you with that, um, Katie, that scene where she looks at the suit. Um, but what comes to my mind most of it all is um, when she's using the elevator to go down to her quote unquote back cave. Yeah. Isn't that elevator reminiscent of Batman Begins? Absolutely, yes. 100%. Yes. <laughs> nice. I, I love that. I love that. And, and, and one of the biggest thing is that weird story that they're saying that Bruce Wayne is gone and Batman left and all that stuff. It, it, it makes me feel like that's one of the very odd things you see in a lot of these shows is that they, they love winking. Like this Elseworlds, more than any other crossover, it's all about we are going to actively acknowledge every single piece of live action DC that has existed. That's yeah. so because cool. Because <laughs> it matters. And it was so awesome. Those well, little the, things like that. If I could just interject one bit of shade before I get to Matt. Um, you know, I, I know I was like praising them for all the mileage they get out of their limited budgets. But I got to say, though, that <laughs> that Fortress of Solitude in episode three was pretty sad. <laughs> like, I don't know. It looked <laughs> like... Why are we showing this? This looks terrible. Yeah, like it looked like a soundstage. It looked like it was plastic. It looked like, you know, they, they would have been better off just like... You know, make it all CG and just add it in post and make it glow and whatever. That room was awful. It was very simple, Mario. He either flies or has a nice crystal palace. I think we wanted him to fly now. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> here's the funny thing. Here, here's the funny thing. It was. Thing for it was me. the studio of solitude. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing for me is that they've showed it before in other seasons. Yeah. And it looked better, which was... So I, it's Supergirl I, season two. Yeah, yeah. yeah like yeah. it looked weird. It looked like it looked like there was no lighting coming from above. So it just it had it looked like you were just in this dark room. Like it felt weird and stark. I, I think they ran out of money. It's yeah, yeah. Like, that was it. That was the, yeah. so, uh, no, budget. I just think it was the barbecue. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> All right, so Matthew, we got sidetracked there. We're talking Batwoman. What do you, what did you think of Batwoman? I mean, I it, it, she was great. I instantly instantly a fan as soon as she called out oliver queen in the in the mansion <laughs> i was like yep i i, I like her because like the second hour of elseworlds is essentially the comedy central roast of oliver queen pretty like, he much. doesn't get yeah. a yeah like he he just he gets it at every at every turn mm -hmm. um so i like that a lot but then i also like that the one person's phone number who she calls at the end is hit is his she doesn't try and communicate with Car car on another That's world true. and she doesn't yeah and she doesn't yeah. have Barry. she she goes right to oliver because they're the you know the most similar mm -hmm. um so i i i like that connection but yeah i mean th that suit is uh i sang the praises of, of the suits on black lightning because i think they are um awesome on the cw but but batwoman is probably the best superhero suit maybe on all of television i they i mean it is they are stunning I, for sure yeah and i definitely want to see more of that suit and Ruby Rose in that suit and on her own TV show, preferably. By the way, is someone tr like trying to bludgeon someone in the back of their apartment <laughs> right now? Like, what does that sound? Brian, then we told you to get the wife out of the room, not to do, you know, yeah. you, know you take it too far now. Okay. I have to make sure she stays down. <laughs> oh, 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 all right. oh my God. He did it with the candlestick in the parlor. And then things got dark. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> All right, Adam, it's your turn. What about what did you think about Batwoman's? I absolutely loved everything about that that part of the episode. Uh, I think I was I was a defender of Ruby Rose when she got cast. Um, all you have to do is go watch her. She did an interview with I think it was Kimmel, where she got all emotional about being able to uh, go visit kids in hospitals wearing the Batwoman costume. Uh, that sold me right then and there. Yeah. But the way she portrayed it. She had the attitude uh, and the confidence that I see from the comic book character. Um, yeah. I, I also I also like the like how she tried to deflect and say you know when Batman left and then shortly thereafter uh, Bruce left because he couldn't because the city got worse and he couldn't bear. So she's trying to protect his secret identity. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go over well, but because of Supergirl and her you know, the whole X-ray vision thing and she figures it out afterwards. Yeah. But but the fact that they that they took the time to ha have her uh, sort of explain that away, you know, was kind of cool. I, I like the fact that the episode was set in Chicago and they, I think they used the same 
exterior of the same tower that. What do you mean, like, like that, that, that they used Gotham, uh, that they used Chicago for Gotham? Yeah, so yeah, all, yeah. all of the Arrowverse films in Vancouver, but they they went to Chicago to do Gotham City. Oh, really? Oh, That's oh, awesome. Okay. I didn't know that. And, That's awesome. Yeah, and the building, the building they used for Wayne Enterprises, I think, was the same exterior that they used in Batman Begins. Which That's to me, pretty sensational. Yeah. I was like, look, if you're going to put anything that remotely resembles Batman Begins, like if you're going to copy off something, <laughs> copy off the thing that I absolutely love, which is which is a good thing. Can yeah. I go more into, I mean, are we, am I just limited to talking about what I thought of Ruby Rose or can I mention like her, her debut, like in, in terms of her? No, action? good. Just talk Batwoman in general. Go? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so her her debut, like when when the prison chaos is going on inside of Arkham, and then she's outside and she's rounding up, rounding up the escapees. Like there were so many nods to different, you know, uh, Batman media. So yeah. like she, she crashes down on a on a getaway van. And yeah. She pulls both of the guys out of the yeah, window. The and dark it was, night. Yeah, it was very the reminiscent dark of, of Dark Knight. And then when she threw the batarang at one of the guys that was escaping, I just got a quick vibes of Batman '89. So I oh, love yeah. the fact that yeah. So I love the fact that they included. All those little little touches were great, and yeah. her interplay with with Melissa Benoist as both Kara and then as Supergirl was great. And that moment at the end uh, of the episode where Kara basically says, "I wish I could stay. I think we'd make a great team." And she says, "World's finest," and they shake hands. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. dope! That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You want to yeah. talk about feels? It's like, a, okay, like do you want me to start crying now or <laughs> go to commercial? Because as a fan of the Jeff Loeb Batman Superman comic that, that basically reignited my comic fandom and then add that with the animated series portrayals, that's right out of there. And had they done this kind of thing in another live action movie that we won't talk about, I think it would have been much well, more well received. So again, it just checked a lot of boxes that, that I wish had been checked somewhere else. And my message to the CW is if forget about just the pilot. If you don't green light this series now, there's something legitimately wrong with them because it has all the earmarkings of a success. Yeah, and I don't and I don't think Ruby Rose signed on to play her for one for 43 minutes in one episode of one crossover like i think she wanted to do it long term i mean it's yeah. not completely her decision but i think she she wouldn't have signed on if it was a one-time thing i think she wanted to do it to make sure sh- with because there was a future a potential future involved yeah. with with that and if you look at the ratings right i mean that was the the, the highest episode a rated episode of arrow all season and Batwoman's appearance was heavily touted in the in the promo. So yeah, no. Listen, the audience I think has spoken. They they're ready for some Batwoman. But how about you, Aaron? Yeah. Were you ready for some Batwoman? Hell yeah, man. Um, I love all the little nods. I mean, everything that Adam was saying about like the batarang and the dropping down on the. I mean, none of that stuff was lost on on you know on the viewers at all, especially those that are big fans of Batman. Um, you know, and, and I think this is the first show or the first time really where they really leaned into the fact that batman exists they said they said batman you know you know there's like the fact that he exists in this universe he also got me excited but uh suffice it to say i mean ruby rose knocked it out of the park like the fight scenes where i don't even know what kind of Mar- I mean, where's Vanessa? Some martial arts move <laughs> where she like punches, kicks someone at the same time. I mean, it was it was great. I loved how they kind of um, they mashed a little bit of like that Black Widow style with a very like rough Batman type fighting style. She just she just killed it. Um, you know, the 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 subtle nuances that uh, that you guys were mentioning about uh, the style of Gotham and all of that. I mean, it just it felt like a very different universe from the rest of the show. And it just felt good. You know, it felt good to be back in Gotham. Um, I think they, they probably, they may have over indexed on the Easter eggs in Gotham, (laughs) but I didn't care because it was just like, Oh, I hope to see you soon. Like, okay, I saw Bane's mask. I saw, I saw Enigma, you know, yep. 
the jail cell. I saw the Victor Freeze. Like I saw all of these things, and I'm like, oh yeah. It's I want to see all of it now. Bring them, bring them. You know what I'm saying? Because look, I'm I've watched uh, probably about four episodes of Titans, and mm-hmm. I know this is totally side 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 topic, but like I'm not really a big fan of it. Uh, but this to me felt more like Batman than Titans did, and I know that Titans is not meant to be Batman, but like this just captured the spirit it, more. Absolutely, a hundred percent. And Matt, I'm sorry, you, Matt was going to say something before we. Yeah, I. Uh, we haven't mentioned that they actually paid uh, tribute. They put an Easter egg in from the Adam West Batman because she had the little Shakespeare head thing. Uh, yes, on, yes, uh, I saw that yes. yeah. in the in the thing so which is yeah, you know you know. flip the head up and you hit the button and then yeah so they got they, everything got the, they got every any it felt like any live action you know dc tv thing from the past which represented in some way um, someone's I, murdering someone again <laughs> yeah so everyone please ignore the sounds of murder we're on the case we'll figure <laughs> it out we'll dispatch yeah. batwoman to figure it out but by the way, the the Mr. F- Mr. Freeze's gun was, I think, if my memory serves, because I had uh, horrific flashbacks, was from Batman and Robin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, kind of like, uh, really? Sure. I think the Bane mask on the shelf was from Dark Knight Rises too. It, was, it looked yeah. like it. Yep, it looked just it like was. it. It was. All and right. The one, the one other thing before before I, you, yeah. you kind of take it over again is, um, the one thing that always sticks out to me in any sort of bat costume are the eyes. And for some reason, Ru- Ruby Rose's eyes in that uh, cowl looked almost like totally black. Yeah. Um, and it, it was it was menacing, and it just it looked like amazing, and it just conveyed like this. You know, I forgot who was saying it, but the, the confidence that she brought uh, to the character and that sort of mysteriousness. And I, I just, it's about time we get you know a, a Batwoman on on some sort of screen and and let's get that episode and series going for sure. Yes. Now that now listen though, before I say what I'm going to say and possibly get yelled at and get all <laughs> kinds of hatred on Twitter, which is just what people like to do with me especially. But um you know, I got to ask a question about Batwoman before I potentially sound mad ignorant. Mm. Is she a meta human of any kind? No. I don't no. think so. I- Okay, so then I have a slight problem with how powerful they made her in this. I know it, I'm, it, it, we're, we're watching a comic book series, mm-hmm. and there's the suspension of disbelief, but she's still just a short, skinny lady. And when she lands on top of the van, and the van like explodes with sparks beneath the weight of her, and she's yanking guys out with one hand out the windows... I'm yeah, like, but... this doesn't like unless she's super powered. How is she doing all that? What well, if the that... suit helps? The suit has enhancements. Well, it I mean... could. I didn't. I mean, you know, I didn't say that, but like, <laughs> well, am, am I just go. being? Am, am I being? <laughs> like, hit, dude, hit. come on, man! Batman picks up a crate on a string. But did <laughs> like... you see Christian Bale in Batman Begins? He's made out of. He's chiseled out of stone. He's a monster. I mean, yeah, he was like what two two twenty two thirty, 230 and then by yeah. the Dark Knight he got down to like 190, 200 pounds if that. And I'm just saying was... like Batman you buy it cuz he tends to be like, you know, chiseled from stone. With Ruby Rose like she's awesome. She looks the part, she has the you know role, but she doesn't physically seem like she's all that strong or that you know that huge of a presence so like her landing on a van would not cause that explosion her reaching in with one hand what you can't yank out a 200 pound guy with a gun around his like Uh, to me it was just a little overblown it's a a comic book yeah yeah but i also think that like they um you know Stephen amell's a bigger dude for doing all the green arrow stuff but when grant was the um yeah, Grant played the Green Arrow. He was able to fight and throw guys around like that too. And he's a skinny little thing too. That's and, true. Yeah, Arrow's you know, not a so meta human. Yeah, that's he, true. No, right. But like when Stephen <coughs> Mel is is a bigger guy, so he could do it. But when when it was Grant Gustin as the Green Arrow, he's still throwing guys around and doing stuff like. So maybe it just comes down to just pure training and willpower. I mean, you yeah, know, the bat, I mean, if the Bat Family has anything. It's it's this. <laughs> 
it's this unnerving will that they just keep going no matter what. So yeah, I mean, listen. Overall, I enjoyed it. You know, I, I just for some reason that just confused me because I'm like, oh, I I didn't know that she's apparently superhuman. And I wasn't being sarcastic. I'm like, as I'm watching it, I'm like, oh, she must have some sort of superpowers. I didn't realize. I guess you know she's different than Bruce. Bruce is just a dude, and she must have something special because she's flinging around guys double her size with one hand. But uh, aside from that, I did enjoy well, Batwoman. Oh, go ahead, Katie. Well, and they could also change her her story a little bit to give her something extra. They may or may not. I don't know. But uh, also, the fact is, like the the bat suits tend to at least look a lot heavier than, say, like Arrow's green leather costume yeah. or Flash's. Yeah. So that could have caused like the shift on the van. But I do agree with you that her pulling out the men and yeah like for me it just it just kind of pulled me out a, a little, little bit it's not a huge deal and I, I don't want to focus like too too much on it but it was just something that just kind of caught my attention because you know like w- w- my, my general note with the Arrowverse is that sometimes like like 90 percent of the time their references and their visuals are like spot on and perfect but there is that little 10 percent of like self-indulgence that one time out of 10 where it's like all right that was kind of pushing it a little bit but it's okay you're generally mm-hmm. likable enough that I can I can see past it you know so you're okay with time travel and aliens yes. and, and i knew i knew that was coming stuff, but <laughs> a van being crushed is too much uh, yeah. listen, <laughs> a, a 120 pound woman jumping on top of a van is not going to make it explode all right mm. all right that's it that that is a, a that is a bridge too far it work. yes she did yes she did um so now let's talk about one of the other big aspects here because is it just me or are they like I feel like they are setting up a Superman series. I, I don't know. If that, maybe that's just my own wishful thinking. But that ending there where they're like, Lois is pregnant and I'm going to have this whole new life. Well, to me, it felt like a setup. To me, it felt like them writing them out so they can't appear in Supergirl the rest of the season. Because like, if you have all this and then you're, we're going to go back to watching Supergirl. But well, why can't she just call Superman who right. you know is here? So to put them on you know another planet and like go away, it's like oh okay, well they're busy doing that and they can't leave. So Supergirl's gonna have to deal with this herself. Because so it was I th- I just thought it was a way to just be like don't ask for Superman the rest of the season because he's see. he's gone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I would agree. Did, did anyone else think they were setting up a I, Superman series? I I certainly hope they do. Um, can can I talk a little bit? Yeah, about go Superman? for it. And yeah. Lois? Okay, yeah. so I, I I think first of all Elizabeth uh, Tolick I think is her name. Um, I think she was fantastic as Lois. Um, yeah, agreed. To me, she was a mix of. Uh, I mean, she made it her own, but she was a mix of Margot Kidder and Terry Hatcher. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, which is fine by me. Um, and I just felt that th- her chemistry with with Tyler Hecklin. Um, and I used to say his name wrong, so I, I finally got it right. Uh, <laughs> but her chemistry with him was very believable. Like I got the, the sense of a longevity mm-hmm. uh, of the relationship. And oddly enough, with two with two episodes between them, they felt like a legitimate couple that loved each other. And they managed to convey that in two episodes, whereas all the other Superman and Lois pairings had either multiple seasons of TV to do it or yeah. multiple films to do it. So I, yeah. I, I, can, I commend them for that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I love the fact that, you know, going to the farm stuff, we, are, are we there yet? Can we talk about that? No, hang on. Yeah, can, can I just say before, we, before you yeah. say what you have to say, I had one of those beautiful fanboy moments where I like leapt up. Like I sat up <laughs> and my face was like, what? And, and the funny thing is I never even really watched Smallville. Oh, that Jesus whole train so, sort of just passed, and for me, I couldn't get over the. Like, oh, in my head, I had like a stigma with that show. It's like, oh, it's it's Superman by way of Dawson's Creek. No, thank you. But yeah. but but in Elseworlds, when the portal opens and you go to that opening shot of Smallville oh with God. the theme song playing, so I the, freaked out. The thought of it right now is making my hair stand. <laughs> I, I, yes. Mary, I have a yeah. I'll put it this way. I have a love hate relationship with Tomorrow. Yeah, like I watched ten seasons. I watched all ten seasons, uh, and, and, and I'm not going to talk about the, the. I'm not going to talk about the finale yet. Well, I probably will, but anyway, I have a love hate relationship with it. But when I heard that, <laughs> when I heard that theme song, 
Yeah. And when they transition and they show the, you know, the, 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 they pan through Smallville and it's the same shot from the opening credits. Yeah. I was like, man, I, I just reverted back to 2001. And you want, yeah. Younger. <laughs> uh, but, and I'm like, man, Smallville looks like it's, it's been how many years and it looks brighter. I attribute that to Lana not being around, but that's just me. Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I knew you were going to say that. I, yeah, I had to do it. Sorry. Yeah. Hashtag <laughs> Lana for the win. <laughs> I, I stopped that. I, I love, I love the fact that you, when we see him and Kara, you know, him and Lois together, they're they're talking about, you know, whether she should write a story, and so they're having a debate about work, which is nice. It, it alludes to that, and I love the fact that Kara is going to him for advice. Yeah, and, and that she looks up to him as the, the, you know, he's the quintessential example of of what it is to be a superhero and and all this kind of thing. Yeah. So I love that aspect of it. And then the scene where, you know, all the other guys come into play and then Cisco comes and pulls them, he pulls them through to come to go and fight Amazo, which, by the way, was amazing because I had no idea he was going to show up. Mm -hmm. um, but w when Cisco goes, who are you? And he says, a friend. Um, oh, oh, I lost it. Yeah. So good. That and was he, great. He, he rips open the shirt. I'm like, OK, two things. One, that is a great uh, repurpose of that line from Superman 78. Yep. Two. It's nice to be watching a Superman on that Ken farm doing the shirt rip for real. Yeah, and for it's real. not a CGI yeah. concoction. <laughs> Although I did like when Sherlock handed him a check to give to his ex. That was hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was funny. It was freaking yeah. great. Like, no, you don't have to pay me. No, no, it's not for you. I have alimony due if you could be so kind as to <laughs> drop that yeah. off. Um, so, so my question. And Sherlock said, and Sherlock said can I trust that guy? <laughs> <laughs> Are you Superman, right? <laughs> so I have a question for everybody. If if the CW said we can do one, we can do the Superman Lois show or the Batwoman show, and you had to pick, oh, which, one would, you, which wow. one would you pick to the series? What are you going to do uh, that to me for? Uh, that's brutal. Why, that, what, what are you doing? Batwoman. Yeah. Oh, oh look at that. Um, he went straight to Batwoman. You're gonna yeah. qualify that with anything, Aaron, or, or you just? That's I just mean, here's here's the thing. So it would be a you know another solo led female series, which I think is great. Yeah. And there's been there's been lots of Superman on TV. I mean, we've got another version of him. And I'm you know look, I know that we're all vying for something to happen in cinema form, but um, you know I think I think a, like a legit bat family type uh series with batwoman being the, the focal point of that is would be amazing and just it's case, about time just in case you guys were wondering that was the correct answer <laughs> <laughs> well hey well, well now let's take it around the table matt because you brought it up so katie what would you pick batwoman or a superman lois show i i would pick batwoman i think I, as much as we didn't get superman in smallville i really got superman out of smallville and so i really think you can't match what especially those last seasons of smallville came up with and so it it would I'll be say. good to see something new and especially since that woman has never really been done like it's something brand new and it's something that can be taken on by someone who's not really been into comics yeah so. well said wow all right all right all right how about you adam okay I'm going to say Batwoman because the upside, you know, it's, I love the Bat world and I want to see more of the Bat family. That's number one. Number two, female led hero. It's, she's part of the LGBTQ community. All that is a win, you know, in so many ways. And it makes a ton more sense for the network. But I will say this. I have a caveat at the end with, and a theory of how they can eventually transition to a Superman show. Oh. So I'll save that for later. Okay. Okay. Brandon, your vote. So I'm going to say Batwoman because I like to have friends. Um, <laughs> um, no, I'm going to say Batwoman, but I have a theory where we might not have to choose. Oh, here mm. we go. Here's Put on your tinfoil hats, everybody. I, 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 I don't, well, I'll save the theory. I know there's going to be a theory time later, so I'll save it. <laughs> but that's all I'm going to say. Okay. All right. Well, uh, Matt. Uh, why don't you answer your own question before I, I, I weigh in? I mean, I, I've i had a Superman show when, you know, Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman was my Superman show when I was uh, growing up. And, 
you know, I've never seen a live action Batman show, and I don't know if we ever will, but this might be the closest thing. You just made listener uh, David Coker very happy. You hear that, David? Sorry, keep going, Matt. Yeah, I love Lois and Clark too. <laughs> yeah, um, but we, uh, I mean, we. This might be the closest thing we ever get to a Bat family thing, and you know, Superman and Lois in this universe has more of an in on another show than Batwoman does. So if Batwoman has her own mm-hmm. show. You know, Superman can still show up on Supergirl occasionally, and you can still get that. Whereas it would be, you could still make it work, but it'd be more forced for Batwoman to come than it would be for Superman to come help her cousin. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, you know, my answer is, is just going to shot. I hope everyone's sitting down. <laughs> but <laughs> my answer, and I don't care about having friends, is a Superman TV series. Of course it is. Um, listen, uh, okay. listen. I, 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 I won't discount anyone's rationale for preferring Batwoman. I get it. There's a lot of perks. There's a lot of reason to champion that. But for me personally, I feel like we have a lot of shows already about dark, like, you know, anti-heroes in the shadows looming and looking epic standing on a skyscraper looking down at a dingy street like we've had we've you know, we've got that even in, in in the marvel netflix you have it with daredevil and titans it looks like that's all titans is um you know you've got arrow we've got like the whole dark vigilante in a murky city thing aside from supergirl which i know aaron doesn't even really like or watch like where do we have that happy wholesome inspirational hero the and flash. i know flash is the sort flash. of i know flash is that but to me, Superman is like the embodiment of that. And that's why for me, like, Sometimes. I would love, well, it depends on how you write them, too. And right. you know, in, in my heart of hearts, they would hire people who would perhaps treat, you know, you know, you know how we've established that all these Arrowverse shows kind of have their own tone. I would love mm. it if Superman was the kind of the more hard hitting show. You know, have the journalism aspect of Clark Kent, have, you know, it's kind of like allegorical sociopolitical things going on in there about fighting for what is the American way in this day and age. Like, I'd love to have a Superman series that tries to like not just have creature of the week. Let's have a big fight in the third act. Like something that's actually like thoughtful, awesome Superman storytelling. You know what I mean? Like if we could get that, I would want that. Yeah, Supergirl tackles a lot of that already. So uh, it, you know, really? it, it would have to be how much. Especially season, yeah. Yeah, it would be right. have to be like. So how much do we take away from the Supergirl show to give to the Superman show, or is there room enough for both? And I think that's a that's a yeah, that's a fair uh, point. Problem or conversation that needs to be you know had to because it's like, you know, we, at first it was like, well, we can't do Superman, so we'll just give a lot of that stuff to Supergirl. And they're running with it and doing well with it. So now mm-hmm. Superman is all of a sudden we can have it now. So what? So that means Supergirl has to suffer because of it now because mm-hmm. now all that stuff I mean, gets I, taken away. Aaron wouldn't mind, but n- n- well, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> I just know you don't love that show. So like, it, yeah, if, if nah, they said tomorrow yeah, Supergirl's right. done and we're gonna make a Superman series, wouldn't you go for that? I would. All right. I, See, I, mean, yeah, I flipped him. My theory taps into that, but I'll get to that later. Oh, okay. Oh, all I right. love that we have theories ready, lined up. It looks like Adam <laughs> yeah. and Brandon are going to have a conspiracy theory off. So before we get to that stuff, um, I do just want to you know, touch on as the as the Superman diehard loser that I am. You know, I got some really good time spent with Tyler Hecklin Superman here, and my opinion is this. Um, mm. I like what I've seen so far, but I need to see more because right now, and granted, you know, I'm not watching the show, so I can't complain. Like maybe some of this is out there, but for me, he seems very like, like mild. He's very like, I don't know how to put it. He doesn't show a lot of range as Superman. I, interestingly enough, when he was the dark Superman in, 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 in the third chapter, you know, I got to see Tyler Hecklin actually do some acting in a Superman suit where he showed a great depth of range. He had anger. He had pride. He had fear. He had joy. Like, I kind of got to see him like, oh, you know, I could kind of see that. That's good. But as Superman, when he was proper Superman, he he's just so like, I'm going to stand here with a grin no matter what is being 
being said to me. And it seems like he's trying super hard to not offend anyone because he knows how polarizing you know, Man of Steel was. And maybe they asked him to be the antidote to that. But to me, he seems like a guy who's being way too tentative. He doesn't want to step on anyone's toes. He almost seems sort of like, you know, invisible in some of his scenes. So to me, I found it interesting that when he's in the black suit, he had a presence. I got to feel him. And it gave me an idea for like what a show anchored by Tyler Hecklin could be like. But ironically, as Superman, he's to me, he feels a little bit ineffectual. It's just like, I'm here to be jolly and the, the stereotype of what you think Superman should do. I don't um, remember if it was last season or the season before, but he's in the first two episodes of one of the premiere, like the first two episodes of one of the seasons. Yes, uh, season, uh, two, season two. Season two. Yeah, yeah. and um, there's there's a bit in there where, you know, he he doesn't really get along with the organization Supergirl works for because he knows they're hiding kryptonite, and he gets pretty firm on that. And I think there's a little more there when he's sort of um, upset with the Martian Manhunter for, like, sort of having kryptonite around and stuff and mm-hmm. not and, all right so, so we do see him, him. So there's, show a, a range there's a of little bit of it from what i remember yeah yeah mm-hmm. okay and, um i would i would agree with matt i would say we get a lot of range from him in season two but i also think the aspect of him being more reserved is that he knows he that he's got a baby on the way and so he's like okay well that could Really, like, oh, hey, Aunt Katie, you like, turned into a robot for a second. He's got a baby on the way, and what? Uh, he's got a baby on the way, and that me that makes him think, okay, do I really have to step into this? Which is why he steps back with Lois onto Argo. Well, that's a good point. That, that he might also just be nervous because he was going to propose to Lois, and so he just yeah, he right. might just have other that stuff was... on his mind, like. Oh, That's okay. True. I can fly through this robot, but I but I'm more nervous about asking her to marry me than yeah. I am to like, you know, fight an evil doppelganger on myself. Yeah, because you know what it is too. Like, yeah, <laughs> after having the huge surge of adrenaline when they played the "Somebody Save Me," you know, Smallville stuff, I remember <laughs> feeling like the scene was kind of a come down though, because like it felt like to me at least, you know, I felt like at some point Kara is like spilling her soul out to Clark or something, and mm. he's just got this like paste on little like grin <laughs> on his face. I'm like, I get it. You're the Superman who smiles. That's wonderful. But, like, can you pay attention? Kara's pouring her soul out. It just seemed to me like, you know, like he just plays it so sort of like vanilla and sort of like, hey, yeah. well, no matter what, I'm the friendly neighbor next door. And it's like. And I wonder how much of that was the director and not, yeah. <laughs> you know, him. But, I, would definitely, you know. I would definitely say if you're interested in seeing him with a better range, I would yeah. go and look at season two. I, I do think there was a combination of the director and the fact that, okay, maybe he was about to tell Kara and he was distracted by, he wanted to tell her that they were going to Argo right then. Yeah, maybe. But then uh, maybe. Oliver and Barry came in. Mario, for, don't forget, uh, I think it was Brent from uh, Fans Without Borders gave you a list. Yeah. And you, <laughs> and you, and you 86 the list and, and skipped <laughs> <laughs> there was so many. I'm sorry, Brent. I only had so much time. My Elseworld was looming, and I'm like, I can't watch, you know, all 20 episodes on this watch list. <laughs> well, I think everybody in this group chat has been telling you to watch these things in squads. Uh, yeah, we but, have. You know, can you just be happy it's that fun. I did it and not oh, chastise yeah, oh, yeah. me? <laughs> I never thought I'd live to see the day, but here we are. <laughs> Up next, I have to watch Krypton. By the way, that's the other yeah, one everyone's yeah. yelling at me about. <laughs> Um, yeah. but hey, how's this is us coming? <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> so, Brandon, I felt like I haven't allowed you to sound off at all on Superman and Lois. Was there anything that you wanted to touch on there? Well, I mean, apart from what we saw, I mean, I really enjoyed everything. I love Lois and Clark as well. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing Tyler Hickman in the show. I, re- I really like to see where he takes the character. Um, I, I got to fall on the van wagon, um, Mario, um, if what you see in the Supergirl show um, is a lot more than what you see in Elseworlds, like yeah. we saw um, scar- um, a lot, a very scarce of, of what he can do as Superman. Okay. Now also, now also in the show, what this is one of the things that I enjoyed of the way that Tyler played the character is that when it comes to the super of Superman, he's always nonchalant about those things. That's part of the character. Yeah, but it's when interesting. It comes but when it comes to the real life things, that's what makes him nervous. That's what actually breaks him down as a person. 
Mm-hmm. So, 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 th- and that's what I think they were looking for in Elseworld because that's actually what you see when he's because when he's Superman, he knows who he is. He's he's embodying that 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 persona. But whenever he's Clark as he flies on, that's who he is. That person that can be insecure. Yeah, he seems to people. play it. Yeah, he he play because some people play Superman like Superman's the real character and Clark is the disguise. But he definitely plays it like Clark is the real guy. Right. And Superman and, is just the I, role and I, he plays. I like that take, and I like that yeah. take because at the end of the day, when you and and so in that case, I don't agree with that idea that he was a bit too, you know. <laughs> well, I personally truly enjoy the fact that whenever he showed up and Oliver showed up, Oliver is over here on the on the corner pumping his chest. That was funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was good stuff. That was, that was amazing. Well, I, I, I love it. And one positive I could say about Superman, too. I mean, I listen, I overall am, you know, I, I'm enjoying him. I just, you know, I mentioned the thing about the range, but I'm not crapping on him. But uh, an, an outright positive I could mention is I love in the confrontation in uh, in the third chapter here where he's going after the fake Superman. You know, he has a line in there, something along the lines of like, po- you know, our powers heighten who we are. Mm-hmm. And I love that because, you know, there's a lot of talk, you know, there's lots of attempts to try to have these heroes you know, question, who am I and, and, and who, ha- what am I going to do with these powers? I'm, I'm weighted down by this responsibility or I'd rather be this way. I feel like a lot of heroes in the last, like, 15 years, post-Nolan, it's so, there's been so much, like, contemplation about becoming a hero and is this the right decision for me? And it, th- there's all this sort of, like, torment around the subject. But here, Superman made it super simple. It's like, if you're a good person... You know, when, 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 and you have these gifts, then all the, the, your innate goodness is just going to be further emphasized. It's going to bring out who and what you mm-hmm. really are. And I thought that was such a perfect Superman sort of message to deliver, especially since the show itself is very big on these characters figuring out their relationship to their powers or to their abilities. And trying to figure out how do I find that balance between, you know, a relationship or a career and taking care of myself, but also saving others. And, you know, I just kind of like he made it very, very simple. You know, you have these gifts. This brings out the best of what you are and, you know, lean into that. You know, you mentioned that. And one of the things that um, I love about the Elseworlds and make me think, I'm I'm going to, I'm full disclosure. I'm about to do a big Sex Schneider DC CW comparison. Uh-oh. So oh boy. I'm, I'm just doing this closure. But one of the cool things of I thought you said you liked about. having friends. What's wrong with you? No, you know, I was like, I, I see the pitchforks in the so torch. I tried to disguise it when I did it. See. But I enjoy the truth. Um so so you have the Man of Steel third act, right? You have everything that happened there. Um I love how the fact that they made it a point that when that helicopter was going down in that final bout. He Superman stopped. had to stop what he was doing to save him. Yeah. To catch it and then go back. You always find the and time. He, exactly. And now, and here's the other thing about what you were saying, Mary, just now about um, finding out who they are or the darkness or that. One of the big things about these, a lot of these DC characters, at least when we meet them or when they acquire the powers, to a degree, they have a motivation. They have something that defines them prior to the powers coming to light or that persona coming to light. That inner person that they are is most defined. That was one of the biggest problems that I had with um, the material that Ezra Miller was given. Because when you meet the Flash and Justice League, he's not a cop. He doesn't care about what happened with his mother to a degree. Mm -hmm. Um, He's aimless. But Barry Allen is his character that's driven. Mm-hmm. As soon as his mother died and he found his mother dead, his dad went to prison, he is concentrated. Every ounce of his being is, I need to figure out a way to bring justice to the victims. I need to figure out a way. My father is a victim that's been imprisoned wrongfully. I got to find a way to free him. That's his drive to become a CSI, not a superhero. Once he's struck by lightning, everything's enhanced by that. Mm-hmm. And wow. he moves forward with his own yeah. life to be a better hero as a Flash, and and also um, to continue that idea. There's this very one of my favorite story arcs is um, Lightning Strikes Strikes, which for the first volume of DC Rebirth, when they introduced Godspeed, he always <laughs> has this conversation with this character called August Hart, where he goes like, 
August tells him, you have these powers. Why don't you kill the reverse Flash or get vengeance? And one of the things that the Flash constantly says is, it's not about vengeance. It's about justice. It's about acquiring justice for the victims, for the people that suffer. Like yeah. He understands that basic fact. Yeah. And I like that Elseworlds ch- chimed into all this. Well, I like that Greg Berlanti gets that simple fact. That seems to be mm-hmm. a staple of this Arrowverse, is this real firm grip on what true heroism is. And like there was even this line in Crisis on, uh, on Earth X that Arrow delivers where he's, I, I forget who he says it to, but I, I wrote it down because I loved it. He was like, it's the strong's duty to protect the weak. And I'm like, that is how these people would look at that. It's it, it's their duty. It's their it is their responsibility. If you are strong and capable of helping, you must help those in need. I'm like, that's so beautifully simple, but so many modern takes on these characters what like to make everyone so morally, you know, confused and conflicted about what to do with these great powers. You know, I love that mm-hmm. about the Berlanti general spin on all of this stuff. Um. But okay, so now I know that we got uh, some conspiracy theories. <laughs> uh, Brandon, why don't you go first and uh, let us know where you like? Do Do you have any theories for where you know, like that that came from Elseworlds or places or you think they're going or how they're going to arrive at uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths? Well, one of the things that they started teasing. Well, it, I think it's just about. One thing I think my I have a theory, but I think everybody knows what I'm going to say. I certainly agree. But um, I'm really excited about Crisis. I love what Elseworlds did, and I think um, one of the big takeaways from the idea that they announced Crisis now is because they're pretty much telling you, okay, guys, so we did Elseworlds, so now we're going to do Elseworlds on steroids because that's pretty much what Crisis is to a degree, especially when you have all these different versions of characters and like uh, I like the idea that they're going to start integrating characters from other who knows maybe we'll even see a, a version of Adam West or something like they did in the Flash because in the, I don't know Mary you haven't seen it but in the season finale of the first season of the Flash when he's running back through time he starts seeing these images of different periods of time of his history and in that one that's the first time that you see the night the 90s Flash costume Oh, wow. um, as part of a different world. So they finally pay it off here five years later, four years later. So everything that we've seen elsewhere is paying off all that. So I think the reason they're going to do crisis is because they're going to say goodbye to all of them. I yeah. think what's going to happen is, and I, and main reason why the final plot device to defeat Superman in, in the third episode was the Supergirl, um, and Flash doing the Christopher time Reeves travel, yeah. Turn, yeah, 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 right. But the reason they did that is because if those that know Crisis know that Barry Allen dies in Crisis, doing the same thing against the um, Anti Monitor's weapon, and Supergirl dies in Crisis. Those are the two characters that die. But these are the two youngest and most successful series in the CW universe. So the reason Oliver spoke to the Monitor is because he's trading his life. So oh, I kind of got that sense too. Yeah, he he yeah. made some so, sort of deal we didn't see. Right, right. right. But so wait. so right. So I think season season eight is going to be the last time we'll see Oliver, which will close with his dead in crisis, Whoa. and will open a and will open a slot to a different show altogether. Whether and I don't think it's going to be Batwoman. I think Batwoman's probably going to be like a mid season show. Like, they can do it mid-season, or at least start it the way Legends started, so it's not the same slot, and leave mm-hmm. the slot for someone else entirely. Not only that, my big theory is, I don't think they're going to do it this way, but I would love it if they do, is that one of the biggest things about Crisis is that Crisis, when it came out, it was a year-long event. It was mm-hmm. one issue a month throughout the whole year. What if, when they do the shows and the season... They're all tied together. Right, from the beginning. Yeah, so that, oh, that would can... be crazy. Yeah, like basically all three seasons of all three of those shows would all work even together Legends. on a weekly basis. Even Legends. No, look, here's... if they do that, I'll start watching Legends again. <laughs> <laughs> only that way can that kind of storyline work, and only in that way can the payoff for Oliver Queen leaving can really pay off. 
Mm. Wow. Because, okay. there's no, because, there's no, because there's no way that you can do a half a season of your, I would say, firstborn show um, and, and end it halfway through the season because we all know that even though Diggle is a great character, Stephen Amell carries that show. Yeah. And there's no way that you can do Crisis, have him die, and have him come back to finish the season. It doesn't work. Well, I... So, so I, 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 that's kind of what I see happening, what I would like to see. Um, but also... Basically, you're thinking he's going to be like Doctor Strange for an Infinity War, where like, you know, he made some sort of decision that would save the others, but kill him. Well, well in, a, in a way, in a way, but they can figure out a way, because that's one, that's one of the best, like, the big finale of Crisis. And not only that, the reason why I know for a fact that Barry cannot die in crisis is because Barry all, even though they have the newspaper, which I have, I don't think they're going to play it out that way. It's just with mm-hmm. the season five. They already did an Easter egg of crisis of infinite earth in the flash show hmm. in the end of season two Interesting. with Soon's weapon. And with soon, I weapon, know what you're talking about. Where he runs around and he disintegrates. Yeah. So, so in season two of the flash, he guides the time remnant, which is a clone of himself. He runs around Soon's weapon, and he disintegrates exactly like in Rise of Infinite Earths. They can't do that again with Mary. They already did it once. So mm-hmm. is, is there anything to say that someone has to die? Well, yes, yes. But I feel like is, Matt yes. has a lot of opinions on this. So, Matt, why don't you why, – why you, I hear you're trying to get a word in. Let, there's let, there's let, a lot of huh. – my, my, my only thing is – I don't think in a million years the monitor would would trade two lives for one. So if he bartered his life, he could maybe choose Kara or choose Barry. I don't think he would be like, yeah, that's a deal. I'll take just you and let both of them live. So I don't think the deal is as straightforward as we all think it is. I think it's something more complicated than that. Not only that, the Crisis on Infinite Earth said it was premiering in fall, which is – which would be at the beginning of the season next year, or it could be around this time. So, um, you know, I, I, I doubt very highly that, that uh, Oliver Queen's going to die. And if he does, it's not going to be permanent. He has to have something else up his sleeve. Cause I don't think the monitor would be like, I wanted to, you know, these two lives for you. Like, I don't think the monitor thinks that Oliver Queen's one life is worth both of theirs. Uh, I agree. I agree with you, Matt. But the, but let's. Uh, is it okay for us to agree that when that a, a death, whatever death happens, similar to Avengers Endgame, whatever death happens prior to people coming back from the snapshot, we all know they're coming back, right? Everybody's on the same page. <laughs> yes. Everybody's coming back. Oh, I haven't okay. seen that movie. Okay. Anyway, so when everyone <laughs> comes back after this after everyone's brought back to life whoever dies after that resurrection is going to die permanently oh yeah i think it's going to be this i think it's going to be the same way with crisis because remember when barry allen died in crisis he didn't come back for 30 years that's he true like he came, he came back and supergirl died for a couple of years as well yeah so but- if you're going to do if, you, if you're going to do crisis but you're not going to do a big permadeath it doesn't it, it's it's not going to amount to it's not going to amount to the impact that at least the book had when it happened. That's my you, opinion. You saw how they did Flashpoint, though, which was limited to one episode, and then they just sort of dealt with ramifications. I mean, they just adapt these things. They don't They don't do them beat for beat. They just take the general, like a couple general threads and then say, okay, we'll put it in our universe to make it work. So, uh, so I, do, you not, do you not think that, that there's a possibility that they would extend that storyline across all of the three seasons simultaneously yeah, that, no because there's there's people who just watch the flash who just watch supergirl right. who just watch arrow and to tell them if you want to understand okay you just watch arrow if you want to understand arrow i'm gonna make you watch these other two shows now they won't do that oh. well the other now the other way to do it i think i've, I've talked too much you guys yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to have you on again soon just to talk about your crazy theories. Yeah, I and, could listen to him talk about Flash for hours. Yeah, yeah and, I was like, wow, man. Yeah, no, no, dude, Brandon <sighs> knows his stuff. When he says he's the Scarlet fan, like he should have that tattooed across his chest. But I'm hey, just... no, hey, Adam, yeah. before we get, I know you've got a theory too about something. Before, yeah. I, before I throw it to you on yours, <laughs> I also want to just take a moment to be like, did anyone else feel ripped off by how little '90s Flash we got? Yes. Oh uh, yeah. Yes. 
right? Like, cause yeah. he looked so great in the suit. And when those images hit the web, like three months ago, everyone lost their minds. And I thought ultimately it was just a very, just sort of quick, you know, cameo. It didn't really amount now, to much. He said like two lines and then. Yeah. Well, he he did one of those things like, you know, oh, well, we'll see. Maybe there's more to tell. But, you know, that's just, you know, you can't take that to the bank. I mean, Matthew, that's your you're writing an article about that tweet tomorrow. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, darn. Yeah. Yeah, like the arrow from Smallville. Yeah. Yeah, like it, to me, that was such a letdown. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. B by the way, I, I, I have one slight cockamamie theory of my own. It has to do with Superman. But don't let me forget to do that after Adam is done with his theory. And then we should probably wrap this thing up because we're at an hour and 15 minutes. There are people who are like, really? You guys are still going on about this? By the way, this is awesome. What, Katie? All right. No, so then we'll have Adam, we'll have Katie, we'll have me, and then we'll go home. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, I see where you're going. Okay. Yeah. They have some of that. I mean, they, they, they tend to be a little flexible on it. Like Batman's about to be in Titans and whatever, right? Well, what about Flash? I mean, in theory, they're going into they're going into the Flash next year, and and they've got this Flash. <laughs> okay. Wow, everyone's getting pretty crazy with the tinfoil hats right now. All right, all right. That's an interesting one to kind of put there on the on the bulletin board. Uh, we'll kind of circle back to that next year when when all this stuff is actually happening. Katie, did you have uh, you added a theory you want to share with us? Yeah. 
Gotcha. Interesting. All right. Uh, so my cockamamie theory is very, it's very simple. It's, it's going to require hardly any explanation. But uh, like two months ago, there was this weird rumor floating around. Apparently uh, started, like it came from some convention appearance that featured the actor who plays Nan in Superman the movie, one in, in Superman uh, 1 and 2. And there was like this weird theory that this thing came out that where he told some fans that they're working on making a virtual Christopher Reeve Superman, like a like a, a you know a, a digital model of him to be used in something. And then somebody wrote like a, an insanely stupid article about oh Warner Brothers is planning a Superman movie where they'll use a digitized Christopher Reeve. I'm like, are you kidding me? What I'm thinking is. What I'm okay, can we please make a lot more noise when I talk about what I'm thinking? Um, so what I'm thinking is, please just you know p pull a cat apart while I do this. So <laughs> I don't know what's happening here, but okay. So what I'm thinking is that it's gonna be one of those little like Easter eggs, kind of like you know, you know how we saw the the Arrow costume from Smallville at some point on the the thing that we just discussed, and sometimes you get really quick glimpses of other DC things, and you know they're, they're honoring all these other bits of DC you know lore. I wouldn't be surprised if literally the this whole digital Superman model with Reeve is going to be part of some attempt of like while Flash is like going through different multiverses or whatever, glimpsing at stuff, we might see the Reeve Superman for a second, you know, because I'm, I'm sure it's probably that'll blow the budget to have, you know, a fully digitized actor on screen. But that's what I think. They like that, that. That's where my brain goes. That weird rumor about a digital Christopher Reeve, and then Infinite Earths, where like they're gonna have carte blanche to reference freaking anything, including the movies. Um, and they have Brandon Ralph. Uh, my head will fall off. Oh, you're such a hater. Such a hater. That would be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> See, yeah, so that's so that is my one weird theory that I I'm remembering that thing from two or three months ago about Warner Brothers creating some sort of digital model of Christopher Reeve Superman. And I'm 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 lumping it in to this crisis on infinite earths. I, but that's the thing. It was random to me, but, you know, apparently he said it to me. Like, it, you know, he, he talks a lot. I don't know. He goes to all these conventions. He's, you know, he's. <laughs> oh, wow. On that note, everyone, I think that about does it for this Revenger roundtable on Elseworlds and kind of all things Arrowverse. What we think of the present, where we think it's going. I just want to thank you all so much for taking the time to do this, to share your thoughts on it, to share your theories, and just, you know, thank you to Aaron, Adam, Matt, Brandon, and Katie. Um, what do you guys say? Should we do this again sometime? Right? I feel, I feel like we could keep going, but full disclosure, where I'm at here in New York, it's 12.15 in the morning, and my cold medication just ran out. It is time for me to go to bed. And Aaron, I get to see you and Chris later today at the Revenger watch party for Aquaman. So I'm very excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, you guys got to get over to New York for one of these watch parties one day. You know, J Matt, you work for JetBlue. Hook it up. Fly up here, man. I thought you worked for JetBlue. I don't know. All right, we'll talk about that some other time. But I tell you what, if I tell you what, if you manage to get here, you worry about getting here, I'll cover your movie ticket, maybe even some popcorn. 
All right. And by the way, can everyone just say, can everyone just say uh, how they can be found over on the Twitter and plug your shows if need be? Let's go kind of the same order. Actually, this time we'll go in reverse. We'll go ladies first. Katie, how can they find you on the Twitter and what is the name of your show again? Uh, you forgot that you're also a manager of a website manager. There you go. All right, Brandon, how can people find you? Yeah, you can. Matt Vernier, go. <laughs> oh that was good oh all right well there you go i love that the, 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 there's some synergy because by the way folks i didn't mention this on the air but matt is actually on the wabam entertainment podcast that's also about elseworld so if you want to hear matt and katie and landon go on a little bit about this uh, definitely check out their next episode of the Wabam Entertainment Podcast. By the way, Matt, can I just say one of the fun things that we have going on is I swear it's like I'm the goalie and you're the hockey you, you, you're, you're the hockey player. You try to sneak these headlines past me sometimes. And sometimes I just resign and go for it. And sometimes, you know, we, we butt heads about Will Smith promising to blue himself for Aladdin. But you're such – I just love it. Anyway. <laughs> so much laughter. Uh, <laughs> hashtag blue yourself. Okay. Adam, Adam, uh, how can people find you? And what is the name of your show? Oh, yeah. And Adam's got a lot of good stuff coming up in 2019. We'll have some announcements about that in due time. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Aaron Verola, how can people find you and listen to you and feel all of your passion? <laughs> Beautiful, everyone. Thank you, and uh, we'll do this again sometime. So that does it for episode 82 of the Fanboy Podcast. I will be back next week with episode 83, which once again will include a spoilerific roundtable postmortem discussion on Aquaman, thoughts on the movie itself, thoughts on its box office performance over its opening weekend, and an overall look at the state of the DC Union as we ed as we head into 2019. So thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, if you haven't yet, please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a five-star review. Let people know that, uh, you know, you like the show. Let's, let's keep introducing this to more people because it's growing. It's been an awesome year. And here's to 2019 being the biggest yet, all thanks to you. All right? So thank you. Until next week, life is chaos. Be kind. Adios. Adios.